are these people? We're going to get to Indie Media Award honoree uh, Sam Husseini. Thank you. Indie Media Award. Uh, Indie Media Award. Dot com. You can get there. It's a link tree and you can find all the 70 honorees. So look at this. Russiagate was Israel Gate, which he published the other day. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, Russiagate, we know, was a lot of fun. And everybody's been talking about Russiagate lately. Um, this scum. Yeah. So this time. We're saying that, you know, he's saying that after Trump won 2016, the Obama admin finally, after years of stalling, allowed a U.N. Security Council resolution condemning Israel's building of colonial settlements, which violates the Fort Geneva Convention and always has. It's just that the U.S. Yeah. has always blocked a resolution, right? Netanyahu uh, asked the Trump transition team to lobby other countries to help Israel stop the resolution from passing. Uh, Netanyahu would sleep in Trump's son-in-law Jared Kushner's bed. Creepy. I hope Jared wasn't in there when he visited New York. Maybe he might have been. He maybe might have been. We maybe, don't know. Iva maybe Ivanka was. Who knows? Um, Kushner ordered General Michael Flynn, who would become Trump's national security advisor, for about six weeks until he had to resign for some stupid shit to contact the Russian government. Russian Let scum. me call the Russians to help. Uh-huh. On December 22nd, 2016, Flynn contacted then-Russian ambassador Sergei Kislyak, asking the Russians to delay the vote until Trump got into office and then could veto it. The mm. Russians didn't do what Kushner wanted because on December 23rd, the U.N. Security Council passes Resolution 2334 condemning Israeli settlement building with the U.S. abstaining. But going back on January 28th, 2016, just five days later, outgoing President Barack Obama imposed sanctions on Russia, ostensibly because of alleged Russian interference, quote unquote, in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Funny. Kislyak then contacted Flynn about getting the sanctions reversed. As you would, <laughs> knowing that yeah. sanctions were put on Russia. That is the origin of Russiagate which dominated mm -hmm. U.S. political discourse for years. It was Flynn contacting because the Russians. Putin's a madman. It was Flynn contacting the Russians to do a favor for Israel. Oh. Nice. How about that? Nice. How about Great. I that? Hope they, you think they helped them build a tunnel, too? Secret they, tunnel. Now, Secret tunnel. Hey. He stole my line. <laughs> he follows up with another article and says, Trump and the plan for the ethnic cleansing of Gaza. Will the Gaza mm. genocide end the same way that Russiagate began? And he asks, is Israel bulverizing Palestinian society and stalling for time so that a Trump administration will green light a mass expulsion? Well, we've known and we've been saying here that Trump will be no better, of course, for the people of Gaza than Biden. We are screwed either way because Biden is blue Trump uh, is is blue Trump and Trump is red Biden. Either way, you're fired with the exception of what might happen in Ukraine and they may shift that money to Mexico or somewhere else. Nothing will fundamentally change, just like we were promised four years ago. So, again, this is from. Yep. Indie Media Award winning journalist Sam Husseini, who sits in DC. He is in the State Department press briefings. He is he occasionally, I believe, gets into the White House press briefings and he asks tough questions. He asked he's been making uh Matthew Miller, which is Count Smugula, really squirm lately. Love what he's doing there, mm. as well as the Department of Defense, their their guy. And uh, and there, there's another there, there's Sergei? a third one, no, not Sergey. Sergey. So <laughs> he says in my last piece, I recalled how Russia Gate was actually Israel Gate because it was Flynn doing a favor for Israel at the UN and asking Russia to do a favor 
that led to Russiagate in the first place and Flynn having to resign and them investigating Carter Page and Papadopoulos and all the crap that went down in 2017. A lot of people forget all that stuff. I kind of had to be reminded yeah. myself because so much has happened since then. Hi, Mimby. Amberberries. Right? <laughs> so... What Sam says here is that similar dynamics may be before us in terms of collusion between Netanyahu and Kushner and Trump. In late May, Israel's National Security Director, Ch Tachi uh, Hanegbi. Tachi. Not Tachi, but <laughs> Tachi Hanegbi said yep. the attack on Gaza would likely last for another seven months, meaning until the end of this year. Look, we had heard mm. from Mondo Weiss and others that they were expecting it to go into 2025. So that's actually a more conservative estimate than the ones that we've heard, amazingly enough. It seems quite possible that what's happening uh, that is, is that Israel is obliterating Palestinian society throughout Gaza, destroying hospitals, targeting schools, and forcing the Palestinians to move around Gaza over and over, including into tent cities. And then we know they're bombing those 10 cities. The latest move is Israel trying to clear Gaza City in the north. Which, yes, and there's yeah. a kill zone. And I think you guys have covered that over on INN News, Reef and Cullen, Wednesday nights, 9 o'clock. Go check yes, that out. Have. Okay. Yeah. In October 2023, the Biden administration was bankrolling 10 cities in Egypt, paving the way for an ethnic cleansing campaign. Yeah, they tend to do that, yep. don't they? We talked about this. Blinken, Blinken, President Blinken, or whatever, you know, acting President Blinken, has said no forcible displacement of Palestinians from Gaza. Not now, not after the war. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. But Trump, yeah. but Trump could. Boy, that escalated quickly. But Trump could, grand, could greenlight a forcible displacement. Indeed. The recent CNN debate, Trump said Israel should finish the job. Well, speaking of finish the job, somebody tried. Well, we're not talking about that. In March, Jared, <laughs> Jared Kushner commented that Gaza's waterfront property could be very valuable, and he's been hawking it all over the United States ever since. In New Jersey, in L.A., in Toronto, we've reported on that. And, yep. of course, Trump has been able to do things no conventional U.S. president could or would, especially regarding Israel. As Sam yep. wrote in, quote, Trump is the opposable thumb of the the establishment. He had written previously. The opposable thumb. Yes. The establishment. Thumb for sure. Well, he's, he's barely a shaved ape. So, yes, it, I guess it fits. <laughs> well, although I, I know that... Uh, People say he has like no. I started blasting. Bam, bam. No, no body hair, which is embarrassing. <laughs> you know, not not very manly. Not very manly. Uh, the establishment long wanted to move the U.S. embassy, of course, to Jerusalem and recognize Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights. It seemed an untenable thing for a president to do until Donnie Tiny Hands, um, and then of course he did move. At Miriam Adelson or and Sheldon Adelson's demand, um, he moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem okay. while everybody screamed. He moved the embassy. He wasn't just dip ducking and diving. He might have he might have done a little dip ducking and diving. Uh, he's te he's not Kevlar Don. He's Teflon Don. Come on, let's call it for what he is. Uh, hey, Ricket, watch them ricochets, man. Um, <laughs> So, have fun with that. Bonans, Annie, what's up, bro? Um, man, this is this. Well, yes. Yeah, so he he annexed that, and then the Golan Heights, which Netanyahu literally named the Trump Heights because he let him do it. <laughs> don't you remember? Yeah. Don't you remember? Don't you remember? Yes, they ma look at how they massacred my boy. I mean, <laughs> the Golan Heights. Yeah. They stole it from Syria, gave it to Israel, and then named it the Trump Heights. Which is exactly what Trump loves to do. Stick his name on something that he didn't earn. You can do it, baby. 
Financial Times reported in October that Israel's Netanyahu lobbied EU to pressure Egypt into accepting Gaza refugees. We also reported that multiple times and that the Israel in initial plan or their final quote unquote solution is to drive anyone who's yeah. left directly into Rainmark. this mi this mile and a half area that Egypt has been building a wall, by the way, a mile and a half in. We we talked about that several weeks <laughs> yeah. ago, right? In, in anticipation that at some point Israel is going to drive everybody else out through the Rafa gate and Egypt's going to have to accept them in except in exchange for um, their forgiving of major, what is it, IMF or World Bank loans? A couple of billion dollars, One if I them. remember correctly. All right. So, yes. Don't be rude. Yeah, you're right. You're right, Hambo. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm being rude. But Financial Times reported in October that, you know, Netanyahu lobbied the EU to pressure them uh, – into accepting them, uh, Egypt into accepting refugees. But recently, Egypt has gotten billions from the IMF and the UAE. That's interesting. Okay. Who's got big connections to the UAE and Dubai? I believe that might be Trump. Egypt is now ruled by you Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who destroyed movements toward reform following the Arab uprisings of 2011. And Egypt has long been criticized as complicit and duplicitous regarding Israel's siege against Gaza. There were even questions as to whether they warned the Israelis in ahead of time that they knew something was coming. I don't know if that checked out or not. I know that there was a lot of talk about it. People are saying. There's been back and forth on that. People are saying. Oh. All right. Thus, Israel is pulverizing the Palestinians in Gaza to the point that with Trump's likely election in November... They can start their full-fledged ethnic cleansing campaign. Can they start their full-fledged ethnic cleansing campaign then? Will they try to buy off Egypt, at least as a departure point for a mass expulsion? Ha! As if I didn't just say that. Well, yeah. it's possible that the transition period in particular might be when Israel would plan to execute an expulsion. In 2009, after Obama won the election and before taking office, Israel launched Operation Cast Lead, which killed, of course, over 1,300 Palestinians in 22 days. Thanks, Obama. Yeah. Thanks, Obama. Um, so, and thank you to everyone out there. It's me, Sarah P. Thank you, especially. I woke up to a couple of 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 um, support. Do, support box and and I don't want to call them donations because it's it's contributions to the work that we do here and we really appreciate the it. Donations, whatever. Stop. We don't want to talk about that. It's we're not fine. we're not crowd funders. We're fine. We 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 make Just things. We are. Stop we it. We we fund the biggest Stop. crowds. Great. Now, we, Great. there's a lot more going on in Gaza, of course, than what we talked about there. Um. One of the things that we did talk about is we didn't talk about it. There's a new publication out on Substack, hmm. which is your favorite place to read things I know. All right, now. Coming to a Substack newsletter near you. She hasn't started one yet this week, but Cara Mariana did. Yep. Uh, now, she already has her own previous um, publication. She also works with Patrick Lawrence who writes the flautist and now she's starting one called West bank alerts. So these are, and I wanted to bring this because this is important stories from people on the ground. She says that because she's been there so often and I read this, and I'm like, Oh, this is really cool. We have to bring this because not many people are unfortunately in our circles are going to hear this. And I think you can all subscribe for free and get these. So she says, note to readers, I now announce the launch of a new Substack newsletter devoted to keeping readers up to date on events in occupied Palestine, West Bank alerts. Since returning from the West Bank at the end of May, I've received almost weekly updates from friends and contacts there who describe a rapidly deteriorating situation. These missives mm -hmm. arrive by text and email. More than once, I've received phone calls. They include heart-wrenching descriptions a seven-year-old beaten by Israeli soldiers and often include videos and pictures, burned olive groves, destroyed homes, 
settlers and Israeli occupation forces raiding villages. Okay. As these updates arrive, as several did while I was working on my first two articles for the Palestinian Voices series that she's writing, my emotions fluctuate between rage and grief. It seemed to me that a new and unexpected responsibility has landed in my lap to find a new way to report on these situations and events as they happen. It's taken me several weeks to determine the best way to do this. West Bank Alerts will focus solely on presenting updates from my sources in Palestine. These will be brief news flashes rather than lengthy essays. Publication will depend on the flow of reportage coming from Palestine and my workload. I'll do my best to keep as current as possible. West Bank Alerts is an experiment, very much a work in progress. Um, she was not trained as a journalist, and she thanks everyone for their patience and support. And together, we, she hopes that we navigate this new terrain. Our input and comments will be welcome. So, yeah. Let her know how you think, you know, what you think. I assume this additional work with, with a sense of urgency, every one of us is now called upon to do all that we can to support the cause of freedom and justice for the people of Palestine. And she's making it freely available to all. Again, West winter, <coughs> winterwheat.substack.com. This will all be in the descriptions and in the in our substack with all the links to everything after the episode's over. Winter wheat. Winter wheat. And she actually published something today, Israel's seven front war just five hours ago. So she's already starting to get this going. And I'm here to support her for that, for sure. I think that's awesome. So mm. thank you, Kara. And, uh, we will definitely be subscribed. I already am. And um, and we'll see what else, what comes out of there and what else we can share with everyone. And I think we've been seeing a lot of the stuff in our, in our news feeds also. But this is another way to document that in case anybody's account gets zapped or they decide to censor any of this stuff, this is just another place you've got to put it to make sure that, that people see it. All right. Um, so that's everybody doing out there. What's happening? What are you doing, man? How you doing? We're wait, waiting on you to get through your stories. Okay. You know? The next one is absolute fucking fire. All right. So I think it was Oz sent me this video of this woman, a, a Jewish woman. Hey, that's what I wanted to say. A winner. A winner. We got it. How you doing, Cynic? We're good. All right. This woman... I would like to bless at 15 volume for every single Zionist, both in and out of my family that has to listen, you know, that, that is screaming about college campuses, that is screaming about Jewish, uh, you know, Jews being unsafe. That is, man, just listen. And holy crap, I'm going to shut up for five minutes and, let, and, and listen to this and let's, let's talk about it after. Okay, it feels important to say this. I am not pulling my perspective on Israel-Palestine out of my ass, okay? I'm not just guessing that Israel is committing yeah. a genocide against Palestine. I have studied and researched this. I have bona fides and I will share them. First of all, I'm a Jewish woman. I was raised by a Zionist family. My grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. My family talks about our spirit of resistance and resilience constantly. Desiring goodness from the nation of Israel is in my blood. And still, I can see that this Zionist state is vicious, violent, and evil. If someone who was raised by a Zionist family, by people who believe that Israel has the right to exist and that it is our salvation. If I can overcome my pro-Israel bias and learn about this conflict, so can you. And frankly, I should not be calling it a conflict, it's a genocide. So when I was in college around 2012, 2013, a bunch of my friends and loved ones started going on birthright trips. And I knew enough then to ask the question when they got back from their birthright trips, what about Palestine? And when these people I love, admire, and respect started talking about Palestinians and using language like terrorists, I knew I had to learn more. I also knew that I wanted to go on birthright and I was nervous about being brainwashed by the trip and I should have been nervous. 
So before I went on birthright, I decided at my small liberal arts school in Massachusetts to get a well-rounded perspective, educational perspective on Israeli-Palestinian politics. I took four courses, Suffering and Evil in the Jewish Tradition, the Jewish Experience, Middle East Politics, and Arab-Israeli Conflict. I also took international and comparative politics courses that often brought up Israel and Palestine in comparisons to, for example, apartheid South Africa. And by the time I finished my ample coursework on the subject before I went on birthright, I was already pro-Palestine. Because once you are in the literature, once you are in the research, not the media stories about this, not the pro-Zionist rigmarole on CNN and MSNBC, once you are in the literature and the data, this isn't a debate. This isn't a question. People talk about Israel-Palestine like it is incredibly complicated, and I reject that premise. It is not. We know that anti-Semitism exists globally, right? We know that Jews are not the most beloved population in the world. We know that Britain has a colonial history and they have taken on colonial projects even through the 20th and 21st centuries. Essentially, Britain already wanted to colonize Palestine. So did the United States. And at the end of World War II, Britain and the US got to talking and they thought, hmm, who do we want to exploit for military labor someplace that is surrounded by brown people so that we can rape and pillage land that we don't currently have access to. Where is one part of the globe we haven't effectively colonized yet? And there was Palestine. And Britain had been trying to colonize Palestine already. And so this was passed off to Jews who had just survived the Holocaust as a gift. Here we're granting you this parcel of land so that you and your progeny can exist in peace and not be violated anymore. Congratulations! Except that land already belonged to someone. Palestinians were already living there. And the US and Britain didn't give a shit about the well-being of Jews. They didn't care. This wasn't a gift for Jews. This was always intended to be a trap of you do our military labor for us. We'll put you here and we'll grant you this parcel of land that already belongs to someone that there are already people on. And in return, you will rape and pillage that land for us and we'll just all share in the wealth. And it might be a good idea too, if like your entire population were to, you know, have conscripted military service so you can really defend that land that is yours. Totally, totally yours, bucko. And if you see who has emerged as the political leadership of Israel over the last few generations, this won't surprise you. This insidiousness will not surprise you. This is how you get Benjamin Netanyahu, someone who absolutely agrees to the premise of Israel as a Zionist ethno-nationalist state, who says we are here for one thing and one thing only, is to get garner as much wealth from this earth that we have, as much tourist property from this plot of land, convert it to dollars, and build up a military so mighty, a military apparatus so great that we wind up producing the world's weaponry. Yes, we have mined this land, and we have used the land to give you war machinery so that we could all murder each other a thousand times over. And to the people already living here, well, we'll murder them too. I took basically a semester and a half of college courses on this, and I know in my bones that what Israel is doing right now is a genocide. It's evil. What they've been doing for the last 75 years is a genocide. It is drip violence, slow violence, protracted harm. It is meant to exhaust the civilian population of Palestine. It is meant to exhaust all Palestinians out of their will to fight. And all the benefit, the wealth garnered from that land goes to the primary stakeholders not the Palestinian people to whom the land originally belonged. I give that lady a massive fucking mic drop. I'll tell you right now. Holy crap. Mm -hmm. Holy crap. There's just so much that she put down there. Um, the thing that she, she didn't really say without saying really is about Jewish supremacy, you know, um, and the thought and the prevailing thought around that within the community. Um, she talked about goodness and whatever, and, and, uh, um, God, I, again, it just, she put, she, she stunned me in my tracks and I'm like, everybody's got to hear this. And I wish that people in my family also wanted to listen to that. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if want is the right thing there. 
Well, I think that you if know, they started to, they would they would sure. turn they would turn it off. And I think that not just my own family, but I was was I I don't think that there was that. It was last week we talked about um how you know the entire Jewish diaspora sees themselves as a family interconnected through quote unquote Israel. But if you see a family member doing wrong, isn't it your duty as a family member to do something and say something to stop that from happening in the future isn't that more your responsibility than anybody else's so you, know, you, you grow up in that culture is you know pressure from family and you know passive aggressive like <laughs> that no well no none of that um <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, okay. I have no idea. Yes. Okay. Um, Sean, Sean, Mike drop is, is exactly what I wanted to see right there. Yeah. She's, she was fantastic. Um, and you can see her over on, on the TikToks. Over, obviously I'll put a link to that in the, uh, in the description afterwards. To a winner. Oh man. How much is her portfolio up to this week? Um, a lot. Microsoft is banning Palestinians for life from using Skype if they call their relatives in Gaza. Nice. This, this came out of the BBC of all places that did an investigation. Mint Press News picked it up, put out this nice graphic on, on Instagram as well as on Twitter. Not X, but Twitter. Somebody says time yeah. to switch to Linux and you can explain why that's not a good idea. Mostly it's software related. I mean, great in theory, but yeah, there's a lot of software issues with that. Um, but here we go. A BBC uh, investigation found that numerous cases uh, existed where Palestinians have had their Microsoft accounts abruptly shut down for making calls to their relatives in Gaza. One affected user, yeah, a Palestinian in the U.S., said, I've had this Hotmail account for 15 years. They banned me for no reason, saying I violated their terms. What terms? Tell me. Then they told them, you are Hamas, sir. Effectively. Hamas. Yes, everybody is Hamas. So, yes, that anybody within Gaza at this point, thanks to Microsoft kowtowing to the Israeli government, um, that they are going to, or they have been banning certain accounts that I'm guessing that the Israeli AI system is telling Microsoft, hey, you need to ban these people because they are Hamas, whether they are or aren't. And how much evidence they have towards that, I have no idea, uh, honestly. But it's weird that it's happening to people that live abroad that are calling their relatives to see if they're alive. And I read an article on... MSN from the BBC that I didn't bring with us that said that um, Skype often works even when there's no internet, which is why a lot of people in uh, in Gaza have Skype when they can even get power to their phones. I know how that works, but okay. Yeah, I, I don't mm. either. Um, it's got some other direct connection. It's the way that I believe that um, Apple works like like how Apple messaging works, even if you are not mm. necessarily connected to the internet. Like when, like it used to be that when I was on an airplane, Apple messaging would actually work if I was connected to like Wi-Fi, but no other kind of DMs or instant messages or anything would. We're all getting squeezed, everyone. So if there's any way that you're able to. We know it's tough out there for everyone. Couple of bucks again. Sarah was was really generous, and and she was able to help us out with 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 some money this weekend. Um, and we're going to get we're trying to get Jesse a new computer. We had a part blow on Reef's machine. I had a power cable thing blow on my machine. You know, this is the regular stuff that we deal with on a regular uh, on a daily basis, just in order to be able to do this stuff. So anything that anybody can do to help certainly it it's appreciated and and necessary because we're we're not getting sponsor money and we're not getting advertiser dollars and you guys are the only people that that we depend on for any kind of 
any kind of funding and any kind of of uh, support. So we deeply appreciate it. Um, Thank you.